Scuba diving is one of my favorite hobbies. There's almost nothing quite like it. Diving in the ocean, seeing the abundance and variety of life there, it's equal parts relaxing and exciting, humbling and inspiring. It is somewhat dangerous to be sure. It is estimated that scuba diving is somewhere around 30 times more dangerous than driving a car. And yet, the sheer freedom and awe of the experience really outweighs the risk involved. I'd like to share a bit of that experience with you, with a game that I find captures something of its essence. Endless Ocean is a game produced in 2007 by Erika. Known as Forever Blue in Japan, it's the sequel to the Everblue series in the PlayStation 2. It's a bit of a different sort of game. Uh, quite a few reviewers argued that it, in fact, wasn't a game at all. I have to disagree with that. It is admittedly very much a sandbox sort of approach. You kind of make your own fun. Just kind of relax and do your own thing. Just explore. But at the same time, there is a bit of a plot involved. There is some level of challenge. It's not possible to say fail at the game, but it's certainly possible to not succeed at it quite so fast. Now, the game starts off here with doing a bit of character customization. All it does is essentially customize the avatar we will be scuba diving with. Not very many options, just male or female, some skin tone options, and two types of hair and two colors of hair. Not really much. It's possible to unlock some additional customization options as we go on, but that won't be for quite some time. Ultimately though, none of this customization stuff has any impact whatsoever on gameplay. It's simply just what your diver looks like. And even then, your diver will be wearing mostly a lot of gear, so you can't even tell most of the time anyways. Now this game is set in the Mono Loai Sea, which is a sort of Polynesian tropical sea somewhere in East Asia. It's very reminiscent of well, basically any Polynesian island or sea in the area. Not too dissimilar from Hawaii or some of the more Malaysia areas. I'll be talking in depth about some of the ocean geography we'll be seeing, as well as the wildlife that inhabits it. Now, the game opens up here with a glorified tutorial level. It's rather unnecessary because the controls here are very simple. We also meet our dive guide here, uh, Catherine Sunday. Catherine will be giving us instructions and helping us along the plot throughout the game. She's an okay-ish short, not too annoying in the sense that she doesn't tend to get in her way when we're just exploring and relaxing. We could have a more annoying guide character for sure. The tutorial kind of assumes you're not very familiar with using the Wiimote in general, and definitely seems to be designed for an intended audience that really isn't the core or mainstream gamer base. Controls are done entirely via the Wiimote, there's no nunchuck involved, it's very simplified and it actually works quite well I find. The Wiimote essentially functions as the diver itself and you just orientate the Wiimote as you like your diver to orientate. And there's some minor tricks with regards to swinging about that occasionally do certain actions, but 
really, it's not necessary in a lot of ways. Uh, they could have pretty functionally done this without the Wiimote, but the Wiimote works pretty effectively, and it doesn't feel too tacked on. The auto swim function is one of the oddest additions to the game, I think, in terms of the controls. Uh, it really makes no difference compared to the normal swimming. You can hold the B button to swim, or you can press minus, and it'll be like toggling swimming as opposed to holding for swimming. It's rather unnecessary, and given that your range is very limited while diving, I'm not entirely sure what the point of it actually being in there is. As she says, it's more for being about being lazy, I guess. Now, we could try swimming and exploring around. We can explore the local area a little bit, but at this time, we can't actually interact with anything, and the places we can go are pretty limited. So, we'd be better off heading back to the boat. Yeah, this uh, look of our protagonist's elbow normally wouldn't be there. I'm in fact emulating the game because I feel it kind of shows off the nice quality of the diving scenes underwater. Uh, it occasionally has some glitches though, uh, mainly with transparencies. And those will be actually hashed out in future videos. Though really it makes no difference in the diving itself, it's more of these top side cutscenes. So we have, as she says, entire freedom to explore the world as we said fit. We're technically hired to do this and paid to do this, but apparently we don't have to actually do anything that we don't want to. Such as being a scientist, I suppose. Not really. I wish. That'd be fantastic. Now, on the ship, we can do a variety of things. We could sit in a chair and gaze at the ocean. Very relaxing. There is a day to night cycle, and at night you can actually see, or rather at sunset, you can actually see the game credits. Fun fact there. If we had an SD card plugged in, we could change the music around and see what our music is. And we'll be doing something with that trunk later. Now the message board basically just has hints. Small gameplay instructions, very minor things. Again, the game kind of assumes that you're not really used to gaming at all. That you really are going to need help figuring out this diving thing. You're probably never going to look at that clipboard again. We can also go into the cabin where there's numerous things that we can interact with. Now in the cabin at the start of the game we can only access our emails, save, and change time. Now it's worth mentioning that changing time is entirely useless at this point in the game because we in fact cannot dive at night yet. So we could just minorly change it and immediately have to change it back because it's entirely useless to us. But the option's there if we really wanted to. If we wanted to look at the sun at the night skies or something. So let's go read our emails. Now we have a mail here from Alfred Thorman. He is our financial backer from the Marianus Foundation. He pays us to waste his time and explore around and look at things. Mr. Thorman seems to be rather the relaxed type. 
And in fact, everybody in this game seems to be very, well, if you get the job done, I guess, you know, you can do it, whatever. You can put it off a month. I don't care. Just, you know, it's up to you. It's a very relaxed game. There will be a bit of urgency later on, but that won't be for some time. Catherine has baggage. Well, there's nothing really we can do up here at this time, and we can't, in fact, really move the boat yet. So, we might as well go to the coral forest, marked at our big glowing red X. While the diving is loading, it's possible to select the music you'll be listening to, and this music can include music uploaded onto your SD card. The amount of songs we can pick out of the game itself is pretty limited at the start. We'll be getting more later as we quote unquote discover them. I know a hell of a lot about fish. She's Aquaman. Finally, finally, we get to touch a fish. So let's go touch a fish. Now, uh, we could touch that fish, or we could touch that fish, but why don't we touch the most interesting fish here? This big old boy. Do you know what fish this is? I hope you do. Now, at first, you know nothing about the fish. But the more you touch this fish, over the course of multiple dives, you get to know this fish more, or this type of fish more. So let's interact with this fish. We could poke it, fish poking. Fish poking is an acceptable style of fish touching. We could also pet the fish. That's also an acceptable way of interacting. I'll just poke it some more though, and then we'll pet it. It is in fact a manta ray. Manta rays are pretty cool. Now they'll give a description here, but these descriptions tend to be pretty limited. So let's give a more extensive one. The manta ray, Manta birostris, is the largest ray. The largest known specimens have been measured at around 7.5 meters across, that's 25 feet, and weighing in the range of 1,300 kilograms, 2,900 pounds. It's found in tropic waters across the world, though that doesn't mean you can reliably find them in every batch of tropical waters. Manta rays are really remarkable creatures in quite a few ways. They have the largest brain-to-body mass ratio of the shark and ray family, the Lasmobranchi. They are voracious filter feeders and will sometimes gather in large swarms of hundreds of individuals that are simply breathtaking. They're often accompanied also by remoras hanging out for a ride and also eating on parasites that feed on the rays. They have also had a very notable cultural impact. Uh, they're also known as the Devil Ray due to the protrusions on their heads, and for a time they had things such as horror movies made about them, due to some confusion about their dangerous nature, supposedly, which is not quite true. They're absolutely no danger to anyone and they've inspired things such as car designs such as the oval manta and they've even given them their name to a baseball team until they changed it to being about sun rays for better pr what losers diving with them is said to be absolutely breathtaking a once in a lifetime experience that greatly affects you just permanently they lack any real danger to people other than the possibility of accidentally bonking you with their so-called wings, and they're often very accommodating when it comes to showing off for the audience. If you're really lucky, you may actually sometimes manage to see them breach, flapping their way into the water like the world's silliest flying fish. They don't get very far, but it's still pretty cool. 
I've never had the pleasure to dive with them, though I would really like to someday. If you ever find yourself on the big island of Hawaii and near Kona, you should definitely try finding a place to dive with them there. It's one of the few places you can find them reliably in mass, though you can get lucky in the Gulf of Mexico on occasion. I've also heard that there are areas near Thailand that are also quite reliable as well. We can also interact with animals by feeding them. Quite a lot of fish like food. And it's actually a good way of getting information about multiple animals at once. There are a few other ways we'll be able to interact with them in the future, but we don't quite have those items yet. Creepy. Now, we could go over there right away, but I'd rather look at some of the stuff over here in the lagoon. Such as these little guys right here. Let's pet them. Mm, it's sometimes kind of hard to get these small guys, to be honest. And sometimes fish aren't very good about giving up their information. There we go. Green Chromis. As you can see, we have information about it as we expected, and we'd have to go a few more times to get all the information. We're not going to be looking at that information ever again for any fish, largely because a lot of it tends to be false, or specifically made up for the game, rather. And to be honest, if there's anything really interesting to say about it, I will probably be saying it. So let's just go touch a lot of fish. As you can see, some fish are quickly accommodating. Here's one of the ones we got by feeding. I love the blue tang. One of my favorite fish while diving in the tropics. The tang are also known as surgeon fish, or unicorn fish. Uh, that's because some tang have rather large head protrusions on there. As the unicorn name would make you think. I'll never reveal the blue tank secret. So this is really what a lot of the game is. It's exploring ocean environments, looking for new animals, interesting animals, and then touching the hell out of them. Touching the fuck out of those fish. And it's a very, very relaxing experience. You'll also learn something along the way, I hope. So let's head towards the coral forest. Up to the left you can see our boat, the Gabbiano. And down to the right you'll see fish. Now, this is one of my favorite fish. It's a bicolor parrotfish. Parrotfish are rather interesting. They're one of the few fish that actually feed on the coral. Research has shown that while parrotfish feed on the coral, they do not constitute a major damager of the coral ecosystem. In fact, they feed on many things that do damage the coral, such as certain algae and seaweed. Controlled by a dolphin. This game's already off to a good start. Now, technically we could head back to the boat, 
already be done here. But where's the fun in that? In fact, I'm not quite sure why we'd be done, since all we did was just swim right into the coral forest. Let's give this place a proper map. Now, there's one fish in particular here that I want to find and poke. Big old fish. Biggest fish here. Now, where is that fish? You may have seen him in the little intro cinematic. He's quite big. He should be around here somewhere. I would hope. There's some butterfly fish. Oh, there he is. I have no idea how we missed him before now, but there he is. This here is a rather special fish. Let's touch it. The humphead wrasse, Chilinus undulatus, is the largest of the wrasse family, with males reaching around 2 meters, or 6 feet, in length. Its most notable feature is the large lump on its head that appears with age. The humphead wrasse feeds largely on crustaceans and mollusks. It is notable for being one of the few ocean predators capable of eating highly toxic animals such as the sea hare, the boxfish, and the crown of thorns starfish. They're also one of the few fish that eat sea cucumbers. Like all wrasse, they're characterized in part by their mouse ability to jut forward from the body, allowing for more complex feeding habits. For fish, it is relatively long-lived, with females living around 30 years on average. But their slow reproductive cycle, with individuals not reaching sexual maturity for seven years, has unfortunately resulted in their population decreasing as a result of the fishing trade. Thankfully, Australia, China, Indonesia, Papua New Guinea, and the Maldives have placed heavy restrictions or bans on their fishing. In the United States, it is merely a species of concern, but it is not listed on the U.S. Endangered Species Act due to insufficient information. Humphead rats are protogenous hermaphrodites. Some females will at nine years of age change their sex, becoming males. Rasses are often used as a model organism for this change, due to its commonness across the entire family. What's rather interesting about this is how it affects their social dynamics. In wrasses, males are much larger than females. Male humphead wrasse can reach nearly twice the size of the female. When a female changes sex, this size difference is an immediate close, if ever. As a result, progenous males, that is, females that have become males as a result of the hormonal change causing the sex change, tend to be, at least in early stages, much smaller than male from birth wrasse. Differences in how these males interact and reproduce with females has been observed. Larger males hold territories and pair with singular females for spawning. Meanwhile, small to medium-sized wrasses, the female-to-male wrasses, so to speak, will live with groups of females and group spawn. As to why some wrasses undergo this change, there's many theories and there's a bit of debate going on about it, but it's largely believed to be a result of size and the advantages of reproductive success that this change affords as a result of it. If a female wrasse is large enough, its ability to undergo female reproduction and its reproductive viability as a female is minimized or non-existent. And if it doesn't have enough reproduction going on where it's unable to find a male to mate with on a singular basis, it will become the male and wherein its size will expand more and take advantage of its much larger size which would likely be present and thus become a much more reproductively viable male because it already starts as male and plus it has much with the uh, group social mating dynamics and becomes a much viable reproducer. This also has the advantage in genetic variability. There are other possible causes that may weigh in and as I said there's quite a bit of debate still over the reasoning behind the mechanisms of activation and, of course, about the evolutionary advantages of the method's existence. They also look like they have the top half of a butt on their head, and their name is quite silly.
lumphead wrasse is the largest fish you can find here in the coral forest, but it's certainly not the only interesting one. Kind of interesting how his coloration tends to differ from the ones that you find in real life. They take a bit of creative license in general with the game, often with sizes and coloration, but usually they're pretty accurate. So let's see if we can find anything of particular note around here. There's certainly some fish we haven't seen around here that we've yet to properly poke. And there's also some different landmarks, such as this odd looking cave right here, actually. What's going on in here? I rather like the lighting effect. Welcome to the Blue Holes, a very small rock cave system. Now you might wonder how cave systems like this would form. Well, the answer is really that they can form underwater. They can form above ground due to erosion, but a cave like this one would normally be formed above ground due to erosion as a above ground cave and then it would be submerged due to the water in the area rising such that or the crust moving in such a way that the cave is then submerged. Now this cave is made entirely out of rock. There would be no coral formation in it though as you can see there is some coral in it. Now coral needs light in order to grow. Now, not all of you may know exactly what coral is. It looks very different from most organisms people are probably familiar with. Though they look much like rock, they are in fact animals, much like us. Uh, they're a colonial organism of many identical polyps. The hard coral structures that we see, such as around here, are in fact the calcium carbonate skeletons that have built upon each other over generations. So the mass of coral reefs, which we're quite familiar with, are in fact the piles and piles of built up skeletons of dead coral. Now in the upper left you might notice that something odd has happened to our radar. When we move out of range, or we start moving out, out of our diving range, that will show up to tell us exactly how deep we are and give us a little notice that we're starting to move outside the general scope of our dive range. We need to stay within a certain radius of our original dive spot. Now coral heads, the general living coral, are colonies of genetically identical polyps, asexually produced identical individuals. While coral grows through this asexual reproduction, coral is also capable of sexual reproduction as well. On the nights around the full moon, species of coral will release reproductive cells and mass into the ocean, and then you'll have the genetic proliferation on the breeding scale. Now, coral can only be found in areas with sufficient sunlight. They can't be found below a certain depth, and they tend to be found only in areas that do have pretty strong, constant sunlight. And that might seem a bit odd to you because, again, coral are animals. Now, why do they need sunlight then? Well, it's because coral has a symbiotic relationship with photosynthetic algae. That's one of the major ways that they get some of their nutrients, along with feeding on small fish and plankton using stinging cells on their tentacles. The algae is actually where coral gets its color. 
When coral is stressed, it will actually eject that algae and essentially bleach itself, taking up just the color of its calcium carbonate skeleton. That's one way to tell if a coral reef system is in danger or has been taking damage. If all of the coral is bleached, then you know there's something up and the coral is in severe danger. Now, the reef itself, as I stated, is merely generations and generations and generations of coral skeletons built upon each other. The reefs are extremely important ecosystem in our ocean, giving home and food to a massive variety of sea life. Coral is also actually among some of the oldest life we've ever found. It's very simplistic. Very corals have been found as far back as the Cambrian period and dated to around 542 million years ago. It's not the simplest animal by any means, but it's pretty damn simple. That about wraps up our dive today. Next time, we become Aquaman. We touch a bird. And we bling the hell out.